Hello and welcome to the second video in this series programming a chess engine in JavaScript. So in this video we're still not going to write any code. I need to explain first of all how the board is going to be represented in the program seeing as this is probably the most important thing next being the search algorithms in the program. So in chess we have 64 squares and they are referred to as so files and ranks where the files are a to h and the ranks 1 to 8 and each square then becomes it gets its own number. So bottom left a1, top right h8, top left a8 and bottom right h1. So if we had a pawn here we would say this is a pawn on e4. And this 64 square board in chess lends itself fairly naturally to representing the board simply in the program by an array of 64. And in this array we can then store numbers to represent what is actually sitting on each square. So for example we could say if a square is empty there's a naught at that index, if there's a white pawn on it there's a 1 on that index and so on. And the way we do that actually in the program itself, or we will do it when we program the program, is actually I prefer to do it upside down so that the index naught is a1 and the index h8 is 63 if you understand that. So like I said we'll then use this notation here say board naught to ask what's on square a1 if we want to know what's on h8 we would simply use board to 63 and here in this board here I've got that represented rather than having the file and rank of the square simply by the number indexing so you can see here. So let's say we had the starting position but just with the pawns then we would have a board that looked like this where naught represents an empty square and 1 represents a white pawn and 7 represents a black pawn. So you can see it's really quick and easy just to test what piece is sitting on a particular square and whether a square is empty or not. And When it comes to generating moves it's also then fairly easy. Say we had a white rook on square d4 here which is number 27 and I'll put a W and an R to represent a white rook and I'll just very quickly change that, good. So we had a white rook here. Then the white rook can move in four directions. It can move in horizontally right and left and vertically up and down obviously. So if we wanted to generate in the first direction in the plus one direction the move for the rook, so to e4, f4, g4 and h4, we would iterate from the rook's current square which is 27 in the plus one. So we would go 27 plus one is 28 and say is the square empty? If it is then add a move moving to 28. If it has a black piece then add a capture and stop iterating. If it has a white piece then just stop iterating because it can't go any further. And in chess as you know hopefully from the rules sliding pieces slide until they get to the edge of the board. But we have one problem with our array here which maybe you've seen is if we keep iterating the plus one direction and this square 31 or h4 is empty plus 1 brings us to 32 and we actually then start make, generating a move on square a5 and then b5, c5 and d5 and so on. So we get a wrap around on the board and we need some way of dealing with this. And one possible way of dealing with this is saying for the plus di 1 direction if we've just generate, if the current square is on the h file then stop generating any more moves we've got to the edge of the board. And we could do this say in the plus 8 direction going down the board here when we get to the 8th rank then stop generating moves. And okay it's a little bit of a pain it doesn't allow us to squeeze up the looping code much as you'll see how we do later in the program but it's a feasible way. But that also starts to get a bit annoying when we start going diagonally. So we've got the diagonal here where we're going 36, 45, 54 and a plus 9. When we get to 63 we then have to say if we're going in the plus 9 direction diagonally and the file or the rank are h or file h or rank 8 then stop iterating because we'll go off the board and then the negative direction is the same in the, in the negative 9 direction and, so, and it starts to become as you can imagine a little bit complicated for all of the 8 directions that we can have pieces sliding in a chessboard so we need to find a slightly more convenient way of stopping this wraparound and the way we actually do this and I've got it on this page here is to use 120 space array rather than a 64. So if we take our white rook again on the square 27 on the 64 based that's now on the square 54 here 
And then if we go in the plus 1 direction, as before we iterate plus 1, 55, 56, 57, 58, and each time we can test not only by saying is the square empty, but we can say if the square is off board, so let's say we make off board a value of 99, then break out of the loop because we know we've gone off the board. And that makes fairly simple to generate moves in any direction because the diagonals go off 21 to 10 here, 98 to 109, and these border squares also cover the diagonals going off, say, 68 to 79, and so on. So that gives us quite a good an easy test to know whether we're going off the board or not, rather than writing in rules about which file and rank we're on and which direction we're going to stop the iteration happening. You may then wonder why we've actually got two rows of protective squares on the top and bottom here, and that's because of our good old friend, the knight. If I make this light purple here, let's say there's a knight on the square 55 here, which would be e4, and all of the squares that the knight can move to are represented by these squares that I'm just going to highlight in a slightly, let's say, an orangey colour here. There are eight squares the knight can move to, and you'll see that the knight can always move two squares forward, back, side, and then one to, then one up or down. And likewise, uh, it can move one to, uh, two up or down and one to the side, allowing it to have these eight squares here. And what that means is, if you imagine that, say we had a knight on square 22 here, and this knight on square 22, say we only had one border row of squares, so the 10 to 19, of course that would now be index 0 to 9, and we wanted to look at all the moves possible for the knight. We, if we went two up and one to the left, we would be here at the one. And if we only had one row of border squares in our array, we'd actually have gone off the array and be, the index would be below a zero, which is very bad. And likewise, say we had a knight on square 97 here, and we only had one row of border squares going up to the 109, we'd be asking for an index at 118, say, or 116 for a knight move. And again, that would be outside the bounds of the array, and as you know in programming, it's very bad when you start asking for things that are outside the bounds of an array. So to protect for the knight, we actually need on the top and the bottom two border squares. The reason we don't need all that on the side, of course, is if you imagine there's a knight on square 58, and we wanted to go two along and one, to, one up or down, we will go 59, 60, and then one up or down is 50 or 70. It's still off the board, because the fact that the sides are flanked by, both sides are flanked by border squares means when you wrap around, you have to go through effectively two rows, just like at the top of the bottom of squares. So if you go from 48, you then go 49 off board, 50 off board, and then 51. So this protects against the knight's moves. So the concept we'll be using in the program then is we'll actually have a board of 120 spaces, and the pieces will be represented by integers on these spaces, and off-board will be represented by integers and also empty squares. So we'll simply use the notation, say if we want to know what piece is sitting on D4, we would simply use board and then D4, like so, where D4 is actually the number 54. And that would give us what piece is then on D4. So I hope that's clear of how we're going to be representing the board. The files and ranks will be represented simply by constants from 0 to 7 for indexing. And we'll be making a couple of arrays as well that return the file or the rank something is on or return off board when it's outside. And that's all there is to it really. So in the next video we'll get on actually writing the first bit of JavaScript code and start with the definitions that we'll need to be writing our program. So I hope that made some sense and thanks for watching. Comments, questions, criticisms, welcome as always on YouTube.